Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Teresa Marantet, CEO and Chief Nursing Officer of the Windsor-Essex County Health Unit. Please be reminded that public health measures continue to be the most important protection to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Stay home if you are sick, maintain a two meter distance from others, wash your hands often with soap and water or use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer, use proper respiratory etiquette, by coughing into a tissue or your sleeve and wear a mask when attending commercial establishments. For area businesses, visit our website to access our Safe Return to Business Toolkit. I will now report our current case counts. There are 106,805 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Canada and 36,348 cases in Ontario. Chatham-Kent has 162 cases and Sarnia Lambton has reported 286 cases. Michigan now has 67,683 cases with 11,840 cases being in Detroit. Today, we are reporting 1,780 cases of COVID-19 in our community, an increase of nine cases from yesterday. Two are workers in the agri-farm sector, four are close contacts of a case, and three are under investigation. 1,174 cases have now resolved. 497 people are self-isolating. 26% of our cases are between the ages of 20 and 29 years. 24% are between the ages of 30 and 39 years. And 17% are between the ages of 40 and 49 years. 64% of our cases are male and 35% are female, with 1% unknown at this time. Our community has lost a total of 68 people to COVID. 49 deaths have occurred among residents in long-term care and retirement homes. There is currently one long-term care home and one retirement home that is in COVID outbreak. In addition, there are four workplaces in the agriculture sector and one workplace in the manufacturing se sector experiencing a COVID-19 outbreak. Symptoms of COVID-19 can range from mild to severe some common symptoms include fever, a new or worsening cough, a barking cough, chills, sore throat, and shortness of breath. Call 911 if you have difficulty breathing and are struggling to breathe or speak, or are experiencing severe chest pain if you are feeling confused or losing consciousness. Please be reminded that Windsor-Essex has two COVID assessment and testing centers, Erie Shores Healthcare in Leamington and Windsor Regional Hospital Olet Campus. SOHAC in Windsor also offers testing for First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people and their families. To check your results, please go to www.wechu.org and click on View Your Results to access the online test result portal. If you are unable to review your results, please contact the assessment center or provider that initiated your test to obtain your results. The <coughs> WeChu will call you if you have tested positive. Please continue to visit our website at wechu.org for the most current information and case counts. I will now turn it over to Dr. Ahmed, our Medical Officer of Health, for the weekly EPI summary. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us again today. Um, I'm just looking at the date today, it's July 10th, and uh, my brother's birthday is today, and we've been doing this for four months now, so we're just realizing today is the date. So happy birthday, my brother. Okay, so we'll move on to the epi summary now. So uh, very quickly, this is what we are planning to cover today. Uh, nothing different than what we have been presenting from, um, uh, from previous week. The epidemic curve, uh, it helps to assess the progression of the disease, whether we're talking about the community or in any kind of outbreak situation. Uh, this particular curve is created to show the number of confirmed cases by the date it was reported to public health. On your vertical axis, you have number of confirmed cases, and on your horizontal axis, you have the date that these cases are reported to the public. This differs from what we usually show when we are talking about uh, starting to show symptoms because we have a higher positivity rate, uh, positive cases with no symptoms and we'll present that number later on as well. Uh, so this, uh, this graph shows all the cases by reported date. 
This includes all the cases in the community, whether we are talking about the long-term care home, agricultural sector, retirement home, or any other, uh, any other cases in the community. As we know, day-to-day -day variation can, can significantly differ, and we know COVID-19 do not cause disease after exposure immediately. So what we, have, what we do is, in order to minimize the impact of day-to-day -day variation, another way to look at the epic curve is to present, a, uh, present it in a three-day moving average. <clears throat> The three-day moving average uh, should capture day-to-day -day variation and will try to present a much better picture of how things are going on in our community. <clears throat> we can see that roughly since the uh, second and third week of April, the number of confirmed cases was going down in the right direction. In the early May, we noticed a further decline, but now we are seeing most of the cases uh, coming back up in the month of June, and more recently in the end of June, uh, mainly tied to the agri-farm sector. This figure further breaks down the cases by agriculture, uh, agri-farm sector versus non-agri-farm cases. And then the majority of the cases that we are seeing right now, almost like the, from a month and a half of uh, timeline, is uh, tied to the agri-farm sector, while the non-agri-farm cases continues to stay relatively stable uh, despite uh, with all the interventions in place. <clears throat> One of the other uh, method of looking at how we are doing is using a seven day moving average to look at our overall trend. The blue line looks at all our cases using a seven day moving average. We see a peak in late March and April, uh, then the latter uh, attributed to the outbreak in long-term care home and retirement home. We are currently seeing a peak in the agri-farm population in late May and thus far in June. The green line looks at the seven-day moving average if we were to remove all the agri-farm sector cases uh, from our data. You will notice that the seven-day moving average declines dramatically from May onwards when, when we exclude agri-farm sector, which would be a, a representation of what is happening with, with the cases in the community. <coughs> Uh, this particular slide captures the week-over-week -week variation uh, incidence rate uh, per 100,000 population, uh, starting from week, eight, week 18, which is April 27th, uh, all the way up to our current week, which is week 28. Uh, we saw a dramatic increase in the cases in week 26, which are primarily attributed to the agri-farm sector, with high number of cases in one or two farms uh, mainly. Please note that the week 28 is still in progress, and it ends on Sunday. So comparing ourselves with the rest of the province and the provincial average, uh, Windsor-Essex now has the second highest rate in the province and our rates are higher than the province. For us here locally, we have experienced a, a higher proportion of cases in long-term care home and retirement home, which was uh, uh, currently is at 17%, but at the peak it was 42% of the cases, include, that includes all the staff and the resident. And what we are currently seeing is an increase in the number of individuals in the agriculture sector who are ill, that constitute 45% of our total case counts in Windsor and Essex. We also know that Windsor Essex is a home to a large number of farm with uh, more than 8,000 to 10,000 temporary foreign workers in the region, which is the highest number of temporary foreign workers across uh, the province and probably across Canada as well. <clears throat> So this particular graph uh, looks at uh, percentage of positive test results reported in one or two days of test date. And basically, mm -hmm. in order to understand this, the higher number of blue lines we see, that means that we are getting the results back uh, with positive reports within 24 hours. The green line indicates that we are getting the results back in 48 hours. So a combination of those two can help us understand how quickly we are getting the results back from the positive test. Uh, throughout the timeline, we can see that there are significant variation with respect to when, how quickly we are getting the positive result. So this graph uh, depicts that, uh, that variation. From a public health uh, measure perspective, uh, what we are looking at uh, in the past week is uh, uh, the case percentage of cases that was in investigated within 24 and 48 hours of reporting date. And uh, this is uh, presented in front of you. Uh, the green line uh, basically indicates that the percent of cases investigated within one day. As you can see, most of these cases are in, with the started investigation within one day, and our team connected with all the positive cases within 24 hours to 48 hours of reporting. 
Um, what we what is uh, also worth uh, noting is uh, in situation when uh, there has been a decline uh, in, or decrease in the number of cases investigated initiated by the the Missouri Six County Health Unit is a function of uh, not having the right contact or having difficulty in the contact uh, connecting with the contact and not necessarily on the part of uh, uh, the, the staff not uh, trying to reach out to those individuals. Looking at the age and sex distribution, uh, what we are looking at is uh, we have got a fairly uh, um, high number of males impacted by COVID. Um, and then distribution is uh, further enhanced in more recently in the in the last two weeks um, as well when we are looking at the age and sex distribution. Um, generally speaking, almost 50% of our cases are between the ages of 20 to 39 years of age and that trend is further increasing in the last two weeks when, you have, when we have 70% of the cases between the ages of 20 and 40. Uh, a large number of this, uh, uh, this, these individuals are from the agri-farm sector, but this is something worth reporting that uh, uh, the, the impact of age and the, uh, the, the people in certain age brackets are impacting, uh, getting impacted more by COVID than the others. <clears throat> Uh, this uh, graph looks at the overall distribution of cases by municipality uh, since the beginning of this pandemic. Overall, 37% of our cases uh, have been from Leamington, 33% from Windsor, and 20% from Kingsville, while the rest of the municipalities constituted close to 2% of all cases uh, across the region. Focusing further on what, what happened over the last 30 days, 50, 54% of our cases came from Leamington and 33% from Kingsville, uh, which, which makes up to 87% of our overall cases in the region in the last 30 days. And uh, in the last 30 days, Windsor accounted only for 11% of the cases. Uh, narrowing it down further into what happened in the last seven days, 60% uh, of our cases were from Kingsville, and 17% are, were from Leamington, and another 17% from, uh, from Windsor, while some of the municipality reported 0% cases overall uh, in the region. So this particular graph looks at the distribution of cases by occupation in the last seven days, uh, and we can see 64% of these cases are from the agri-farm sector. 2% uh, of these cases are healthcare worker, while the rest are other unemployed, retired, are, are missing uh, information of, uh, from an occupation perspective. Looking, f uh, breaking it down further in terms of the reporting date uh, the, and the potential exposure. Uh, so we have classified the exposure into three categories. One is travel related, which we can see with the blue lines at the beginning, where most of the cases were related to travel. And then uh, the second category is the green one with close contacts, and that's what we uh, we w what happens when someone who is already diagnosed with COVID and then potentially infecting other people. And then uh, the third one uh, is by community exposure, when we cannot tie a, an individual with an identified case or a, a, through a travel. So that means they spread uh, it, the person acquired it in the community or through an unknown source. What we are looking more and more is the individuals are contracting COVID with all these green, li green lines is uh, most of these, uh, uh, these exposure are happening through close contact. Uh, which is good, but also it reminds the importance of keeping the number of close contacts to a minimum to, uh, to contain it if, in case some, uh, someone uh, contract COVID. The slide looks at the exposure of agri-farm sectors on the past 30 days. While the majority of cases have primarily acquired the, the illness through close contacts, we are seeing instances where it is uh, where we do not have an identified uh, close contact and probably community acquired, uh, but that's something that uh, majority of the cases are close contact and uh, as a result of living in close quarters in congregated living settings, uh, leading to all these exposures and uh, potentially uh, causing disease spread in, in this population. Uh, this one slide focuses on just on healthcare worker. Uh, so all the cases that we are seeing in the healthcare workers, 23% uh, of the healthcare worker cases in our region are from healthcare worker that works in Michigan, while the 77% of the cases are uh, local worker who work uh, in the local health uh, healthcare sector. 
<clears throat> Another question that is frequently asked is if the cases had any underlying chronic condition, and about 27% of these cases had some medical condition while it was chronic, underlying, or if they were immunocompromised. <clears throat> So we, uh, we, we, we talked about symptomatic versus asymptomatic cases. Overall, 25% of our cases were asymptomatic, meaning they, did, they, they showed no symptoms or signs of COVID, and that's uh, almost one-fourth one of our cases. And this could be because either they may have been already been sick and symptoms were resolved before we tested or truly had no symptoms. Uh, individuals can shed the virus, we know, for up to 90 days, even after recovering, and continues to stay positive uh, when tested using these uh, NP swabs. Approximately 60% of our cases were symptomatic, and 15% are unknown at this time. A quick look at the cases and what, hap what symptoms they are reporting of the individuals reporting at least one symptom. 65% of our cases had some type of cough, either new, worsening, or productive, uh, while the rest of the cases are continuing to show with fever, headache, malaise, fatigue, uh, among other symptoms. And please note that these, uh, some individuals, or most, most cases, report more than one symptom, and that's why these numbers will not add up. <clears throat> Focusing more on the hospitalization and ICU for COVID-19, uh, this particular graph shows how we are doing with respect to ICU cases of uh, our hospitalization associated with COVID-19. Uh, cases in the ICU remain relatively low and have gone down to zero. The red line indicates the seven-day moving average in the ICU, showing a decreasing trend in the ICU. Hospitalization have fluctuated more so than the ICU. We have seen a sharp decline in the number of inpatient hospitalizations for COVID in June, but since then it has stabilized uh, um, um, it has stabilized. So moving beyond COVID uh, as an overall health system capacity, this, talk, this particular slide is talk about that. The orange line highlights the occupancy rate of acute care bed. Uh, the threshold is to have the occupancy rate to below 85%, which we are currently meeting uh, and touching it. The signals that we are currently able to meet the guidelines uh, with 15% of the capacity of acute care bed in the system. The green line and the dark blue lines are for the ICU capacity and ICU, ICU ventilator beds, respectively. For ICU capacity, we'll look at the overall ICU capacity and ventilator beds. While there is no established thresholds, we are aiming to have it less than 50% of, of our overall ICU bed capacity. Higher than this may lead to a stress in the healthcare system if COVID-19 cases increase in the community. Uh, but overall, we've been managing well with, uh, with respect to healthcare system capacity and uh, having all these strong public health measures in place is uh, driving those numbers down and to allow the health system to focus on some of the other priorities. So where are we with all these cases? 64% uh, of our cases are resolved and approximately 30% of cases are self-isolating. Unfortunately, we lost 4% of our cases uh, uh, in, on the community uh, lost to COVID. We are seeing a minimal number of cases in the hospital or in the ICU bed, uh, and we are still investigating 2% of our cases. <clears throat> Among those who died uh, with, with COVID, uh, the majority of these individuals are a female, uh, more female died compared to males. And then uh, the, from an age distribution perspective, almost 70% of the death were in individuals who were 80 years and older. The youngest person who died in our region was a man in his 20s. Comparing our case fatality rate with the rest of the province, uh, our overall case fatality rate is uh, much lower than the province. Uh, our case, uh, case uh, uh, fatality rate is 3.8% overall compared to the province, which is 7.4%. Focusing in on the long-term care home and retirement home, we have our case fatality rate was 16% compared to the overall uh, long-term care home case fatality rate, which is close to 22%. The doubling time uh, tells us how many days it will take to see twice as many COVID-19 cases in the region. It is, uh, it is showing some flattening of the, of the curve, but uh, now cases are more and more confined within the uh, agri-farm sector. Looking at day-to-day -day variation, we have seen significant day-to-day -day variation as we are uh, working through with this agri-farm sector cases. 
uh, with many, many cases uh, showing up in the agri-farm sector, which is driving our, our number uh, down from a case doubling perspective, which is much lower than the provincial average. The most recent estimated mean R0 is 1.06, and uh, when the R0 is greater than 1, each existing infection caused more than one new infection. Our R0 estimate has increased recently due to the cases in the agri-farm sector, uh, but when the R0 is less than 1, every infection is causing less than new infections. So that's our goal to keep that R0 below 1, uh, signaling a decrease in the community cases. Uh, right now, we're, we're, we're just touching one um, uh, R0 of 1 in the community. So in summary, Windsor Essex continued to see huge variation in cases day over day, and these spikes are mainly attributed to the agri-farm sector, uh, where we're seeing most of the activity. The more recent cases are coming from uh, these sectors and also uh, concentrated in the Leamington and Kingsville area, with some cases uh, in Windsor and uh, the rest of the, the rest of the municipality showing a uh, minimum number of cases overall. The primary source of exposure continues to stay uh, uh, with the close contact with the confirmed case. Uh, and uh, most of these cases, because of the congregate living settings, are uh, having a high exposure and uh, developing disease um, in a much higher number compared to the rest of the community. COVID-19 related hospitalization and ICU capacity have significantly um, um, decreased and uh, of the overall as a region, we have enough capacity in the system to meet the, meet the, uh, meet the increased need of hospitalization uh, beds and ICU beds if COVID-19 cases increase in our community. The overall R0 effective rate is 1.06, indicating that, uh, that uh, we are coming closer to uh, an R0 of 1, but we like to see it going down below 1 to, to see a strong impact in the community. Thank you. The conference is now unmuted. We'll now take uh, questions from the media. We'll start with CBC. Good morning. I'm just wondering if we have any numbers on how many active cases there are among workers in the agri-farm industry. So uh, at, at this point, I want to say yesterday when I was looking at the data, we have close to 290 cases active in the agri-farm sector. And, uh, and uh, some of them are maybe just a few days away from uh, getting resolved or uh, discharged from the care. And that would significantly uh, drop down the number to, to close to 150 or so. But uh, this is something that we will continue to monitor. The way we discharge the case is to make sure that they do not have any symptoms. We do not just automatically use the 14 days timeline to discharge them, we, we, we make sure that they do not have any active symptom at this time or their symptoms are improving overall before we can discharge them. So we will see some changes uh, in the next coming days when this number will significantly go down. And when you say discharge them, do you mean from self-isolation, whether that's hotels or motels in the area and things like that? That is correct, yes. Okay. Um, and then could you just explain I know we talked about this yesterday, but there's a significant discrepancy in the numbers uh, the province is reporting yesterday for confirmed cases for our area and numbers that the health unit is reporting. Could you just explain again what is behind that discrepancy? So uh, we touched on that. So there are different timelines that we use to extract our data uh, for reporting purposes. Uh, we use a cutoff timeline of 8 p.m. every night. So for example, whatever data that we are reporting to you this morning, the cutoff timeline is 8 p.m. that we use. Sometimes when we are getting the data after 8 o'clock, that is not captured and reported in the next morning update. And depending on when the province is extracting those data, that, that number can vary. So some of the variation that, we, that, uh, that was seen yesterday and was reported to the ministry as well is, uh, is just based on that. And depending on their data downloading cycle, it showed a higher number. And the, but then overall, when you put in two days worth of information, it turns out to be exactly the same because we are the one who is receiving that information. So there may be some challenges and that, uh, that's why unless we are all using the same cutoff timeline, you may see some, some variation. 
Um, but we use our eight o'clock timeline to be prepared to report next morning, and uh, that's the one. That's the one that we use. Thank you so much. Any questions from Blackburn? Yeah, just going back to the asymptomatic um, cases that you reported in the numbers there, was this after you, were these numbers kind of after you spoke to these people and figured out when or if they may have had symptoms at some point, or is this at the time of, um, like, getting their test? So it's a combination of both. Usually when we are talking about asymptomatic surveillance testing, the underlying assumption is anyone who's going through that asymptomatic surveillance cycle, they're supposed to be asymptomatic. When we are getting a positive results back, our team do our investigation and collect additional data and, uh, and, uh, and in one form, our team went out to do a health assessment on the, all those individuals as well. So based on that interview and that assessment, we may agree that yeah they are asymptomatic or we may say no you have some symptoms which maybe you have never paid attention so then we that that's how we're reporting it the one farm that we have seen a huge spike in the number of cases majority of them were asymptomatic and that's what's driving that number and uh but the majority of the cases that uh, otherwise we are seeing in the community and everywhere else are all symptomatic cases and even in the farms, that there are some symptomatic cases that uh, that we follow, and then when we when we investigate, um, uh, we find more uh, symptomatic people, and then we expand the investigation to include pretty much everyone who is uh, who is impacted or identified as close contacts. So the community shouldn't be concerned then that twenty five percent of our cases are asymptomatic. These are not generally speaking, or statistically speaking, they're not community cases. Yeah, that would be that would be accurate because most of the cases that we are seeing in the community, it's uh, it's uh, it, it they have symptoms, and then uh, there are uh, I I did another presentation some time ago about the the timeline of the testing and the limitation of the testing. So what we are using as a nasopharyngeal swab testing is a, is a, is a, it cannot differentiate between an active infection that's happening or maybe an infection that happened a week ago or two weeks ago or three weeks ago. What we are finding with uh, with more research is a person can continue to shed virus up to 90 days. So anyone who was infected uh, a month ago or two months ago or within the 90 days timeline, if we test them, they will report that they don't have any symptoms. And maybe even if we go back to their history, they may not recall anything for the last two, three weeks, but they will test positive And then they may feel that, oh, well, they're asymptomatic. Can they spread? Can they spread the disease? Uh, and uh, more and more data that we're, what we are seeing is uh, with, with strong evidence that after eight to 10 days, uh, most of these individuals are non-infectious and are unable to cause infection in someone else. But again, those are all the research that is continuing to evolve. This is what the timeline that we're using, the CDC and some of the other governments are using between a marker of eight to 10 days to clear cases. In Ontario, we use 14 days before we can clear a case. So anyone who is being diagnosed, we can't really say if they're asymptomatic, whether they are truly asymptomatic or they've had infection in the past. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Any questions from Amy Hunter? Yes, uh, I was just wondering, um, this morning the city with uh, Kingsville and Leamington and some hospital representatives are having a news conference and an event just talking about better coordination um, needed to deal with the migrant workers. Um, why was the health unit not involved in today's actual news conference or were you a part of this effort or what's, what's going on there? Um, good question. I think uh, uh, all I can say is uh, when we are talking about coordination, that's the indication and that's the issue that uh, we are seeing right now. And uh, it's very easy to say, yeah, public health is not stepping up, but uh, no one reached out to me or public health to get that invitation, which is uh, unfortunate. I think our community can do better. Our community can do a strong leadership in taking a leadership role in taking it instead of uh, trying to work in silos. And uh, as much as public health is doing its best with its staffing and everything, I think we can see where the struggle is. It's not in public health. Public health is doing everything that we can. 
Okay, so um, I mean, do you, I guess, do you feel uh, like offended by this or like angry? It just seems kind of bizarre. Like you mentioned working in silos that, you know, there's a news conference happening about better coordination needed, but our public health uh, officials aren't involved in that discussion. I'm not angry, actually. I'm frustrated and I'm sad that I think uh, this uh, our community can do better. This is a significant problem that we are seeing in the community throughout this pandemic. Uh, it's easy to point fingers. It's easy to, to paint a blame to anyone that we are seeing right now. And uh, it's, it's just unfortunate. I think if we can combine our collective resources together, we can serve our community better. But unfortunately, it's left to public health to deal with whatever we are doing. And we will do it. It's, we are, all of us are doing it for the community and uh, we'll continue to move forward. We'll do whatever we need to. We'll connect with whoever we need to. But uh, clearly there is a disconnect. There's, a, there's an issue. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there's no resolution to it. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, how do you move forward from here? Because obviously this pandemic is ongoing. There are going to continue to be issues that arise. So how does this affect the working relationship between the health unit and public health with you know our different hospital systems and the city and the different towns so public health is uh, constitute two percent of the entire healthcare system and the entire healthcare system budget um, our team even though as small as it is if needed our team is out there public health is not frontline public health do not go and do this assessment but whenever it's needed we went out because we felt that this is the need and if we are not having that support our staff still need to do the work that we need to we needed to know what what is what what needs to happen we were doing it it's been almost four months now that our team is working really hard in this pandemic and throughout the pandemic we have seen what work what doesn't doesn't work and our staff has been working non-stop just to serve the community we have given uh, lots of uh, negative feedback we have given lots of uh, uh, criticism but uh, our focus has always been serve the community, whatever is needed. If it's a gap, we have to step in, we have to do it. And that's been public health has been doing it. We have been asking for a number of months now for some concrete measures to, to, do, uh, to act on things that is needed for public health action. But unfortunately, all we are seeing is nothing and public health continues to do through whatever we, our resources are and uh, again, going back to the same idea, we're just 2% of the entire healthcare system. Our budget is 2% of the entire healthcare system. Our staffing resources and complements are still there. And uh, we'd say it's just a few handful of people in public health that are trying to manage the number of cases. And as we presented with the case counts and the case rate, which we can see it's comparable now, it's not in a, in a good way, but now get coming closer to the case counts and the caseloads in Toronto. And all your public health department is managing all these cases on their own. And more recently, we got some support. But still, the bulk of the cases, everything is managed by a small or a medium-sized health unit, if you want to call it, just on their own with limited or to no support from anyone else. Okay, thank you. Any questions from Winsright? I just wanted to get your uh, thoughts on um, airborne transmission. Um, CNN and other um, national and international media are reporting that uh, a group of, group of uh, 230 scientists have hypothesized that COVID can actually spread through the air indoors um, to distinguish that from uh, the kind of like, transmission that is already happening. Have we seen any examples of uh, airborne transmission happening in Windsor Essex in any of the cases we've had? Well, I think uh, it would be hard to say if we have seen any evidence of transmission in that way, but we can go back to the science part of it, that how and how do you classify a disease as an airborne disease versus a droplet or uh, droplet spread? We know with all the evidence that's available, it's a droplet and it's a spread because generally speaking, if it's an airborne infection, then the numbers could have been much, much, much bigger than what we are seeing right now. And in any of the workplace, if you have one person, then potentially everyone should be infected. So clearly the evidence doesn't point out to the fact that it's an airborne disease. And uh, more and more what we know is continues to be the droplet spread. 
there is a this distinction and I think it's another thing that uh, uh, in the public health world what we are struggling is and no disrespect to any of the other uh, healthcare professionals and scientists but uh, variation from clinical one uh, infectious disease specialist even there are uh, the approach to treat one particular case and the potential variation in that one particular case is always an exception it's not the norm when public health decision makings are happening it's not made on those exceptions those are made on the overall impact on the community so there's a whole science and there's a whole specialty that's dedicated to the public health and how public health emit actions and mitigations are happening so having said that um, the possibility of an airborne uh, or the virus to survive in those droplets for a few minutes it's possible but how much of an impact it is in the spread of the disease is clearly something that I think it's it's not there the evidence is not there because if the evidence of airborne spread is there we must have seen thousands and thousands of cases and pretty much everyone in indoor spaces if you got one case everyone should be infected by it so we are the evidence is not there but again this is something that's currently being st uh, strongly and heavily researched and uh, if more evidence comes in if the ev uh, the recommendation need to change it will change but so far based on what is available there's not enough evidence to suggest that it can it is a uh, airborne spread is something that uh, uh, that we need to uh, take strong actions on the possibility is always there but those will be the exception uh, good thanks uh, good explanation thank you um, on another similar topic have we seen anything about uh, point of care testing or antibody testing you know making its way to uh, Windsor Essex uh, yeah, so those conversations are actively happening and uh, we just heard from the public health lab uh, as well that there are some uh, some testing that will be starting some of the initiatives mainly targeting the pediatric population to do more uh, mass testing of antibodies to uh, to differentiate some of the uh, cases that were being seen in uh, pediatric population uh, like Kawasaki like syndrome and uh, the the and the impact is to assess all those uh, pediatric population to have a sense of what's happening but then the the plan is to expand those testing to include other type of initiative and uh, data associated with that any questions from the Windsor Star any questions from CTV good morning uh, the independent, the Ontario Independent Fitness Studio Association, who represents a few small gyms in Windsor, is saying that they shouldn't be grouped in the same category as big box gyms and should be allowed to reopen. Do you believe that smaller local gyms should be allowed to open earlier? And how safe do you think it would be for them to open at this time? So the simple answer is the gyms are uh, uh, closed under the provincial order. Uh, so there is nothing that uh, locally that we can do. Um, obviously, there are a number of public health measures we can put forward to say uh, how these facilities can be used safely. Uh, but again, because this is a direction from the province right now, so we'll just following just the, what the provincial direction is. Okay, thank you. Any further questions from CBC? No, thank you. Blackburn? No, thank you. Amy Hundred? Windsor Eight? No, thanks. Windsor Star? Uh, yes, actually, Doctor, sorry, I'd muted myself the first time around. Uh, just to go off of Owen's uh, question previously, so that means that antibody testing uh, for kids in the pediatric population here will soon be beginning in Windsor, Essex. Uh, that's what my understanding is. The, the Public Health uh, Ontario lab is developing that protocol, and it will start uh, soon. I don't have a timeline, but uh, that's the that's the plan. Okay, and then um, about the discrepancy between local and provincial numbers. So it sounds to me like sometimes the province is lumping more than one day of results into one presentation. Is that accurate? Yeah, uh, that's 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 pretty much accurate. And again, uh, some of the data that Public Health Ontario is uh, putting into an electronic system, 
and then the province is extracting that data and by the time it's reported back to us it could it could also vary they may report it very quickly to the province but may there may be a delay in uh, us getting the results so there could be a number of possibility but you rightly identified that uh, sometimes just because of uh, the data can be lumped together in one day, which could be different than what we are reporting. Okay, thank you so much. Any further questions from CTV? No, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good weekend. Thank you.